Pauline also made some elegant presents to Countesses Bertrand and Montalon, consisting of some beautiful porcelain, unique in the world, presented to him by the city of Paris with some handsome crepes to Count Bertrand, a fine set of chessmen to Count Montalon, a handsome ornament, etc. All the children were also gratified with some elegant gift from him. The weather was so bad and so foggy that the signal from Deadwood could not be discerned. A second, Cipriani in town buying provisions. The third, Napoleon had been ill during the night but felt better in pretty good spirits. After some conversation, I asked his opinion about George. George said he was una bestia ignorante, not ignorant blockhead. He had courage, and that was all. After the peace with the Shuans, I endeavored to gain him over, as then he would have been useful to me, and I was anxious to calm all parties. I sent for and spoke to him for a long time. His father was a miller, and he was an ignorant fellow himself. I asked him, why do you want to restore those bourbons? If even you were to succeed in placing them upon the throne, you would still only be a miller's son in their eyes. They would hold you in contempt because you're not of noble birth. But I found that he had no heart. In fact, he was not a Frenchman. A few days after, he went over to London. The fourth, the spy man of war arrived and brought the news of the destruction of the Algerine ships and the treaty which they had been obliged to make. The fifth, Sir Hudson Lowe at Longwood had a long conversation with him concerning the restrictions. His Excellency said that he had no objection to allow General Bonaparte to ride to the left of Hud's gate in the direction of Miss Mason's, but that he did not like to grant the same permission to his attendants. I observed that it would be difficult to draw such a line of distinction as Napoleon never rode out without being accompanied by two or three of them. Sir Hudson Lowe replied that he had no objection to their being permitted to ride in that direction when in company with General Bonaparte, but without him, he would not grant it. He then desired me to tell General Bonaparte that he might ride in that direction whenever he pleased, that there would be no impediment to his going. I observed that he had better make Count Bertrand acquainted with it, and also that some notice ought to be given to the sentinel at Hunt's Gate, otherwise he would stop him if he attempted to avail himself of the permission. Sir Hudson Lowe replied that the sentinel had no orders to stop him. I said that General Montalon and Gorgo had been stopped several times when going to the alarm house, though within the limits. The governor replied that this must be a mistake, as the sentinels had no orders to stop them. I observed that I had been twice stopped myself by the sentinels in that spot. How can that be, said Sir Hudson? as the Sentinels have orders only to stop French people. I answered that the Sentinel had said that he had orders to stop all suspicious people, and that conceiving me to be one, he had stopped me, for which I could not blame him. His Excellency laughed at the Sentinel asserted that he would not enlarge the limits, that they were fixed, but that he would give General Bonaparte leave to extend his rides in different directions and order me to tell him that he might ride within the old limits unaccompanied, that no impediment would be opposed. So Napoleon shortly after, to whom I conveyed his excellency's message, he asked me if the pickets had been placed upon the hills as formerly when he used to ride in that direction. I replied that I had not observed them. He took out his glass and looked towards the spot for a moment. And formed Napoleon of the Algerine Affair and gave him a paper which contained the official details. After reading it, he professed great pleasure that those barbarians had been chastised, but observed that the victory we had gained did not alter his opinion as to the best mode of acting with them. You might, said he, have settled it equally well by a blockade. It is no doubt reflects great credit upon the English sailors for their bravery and skill, yet still I think that it was hazarding too much to be sure you affected a great deal and got away because your seamen's were so good. But that is an additional reason why you should not run the risk of sacrificing them. Get such good night. There are no other seamen except the Americans who would have done what yours affected or perhaps have attempted it. Notwithstanding this and that you have succeeded, it was madness and an abuse of the Navy to attack batteries elevated above your ships. 
which you could not injure, to engage red hot balls and shells and run the hazard of losing a fleet. And so many perceive it against such canai. Independent of the disgrace which it would have been to England to be beaten by the barbarians, which ought to have been the case, if the Algerines had fired upon you in coming down instead of like imbeciles, allowing you to take up your positions quietly in anchors, if you were going to a review, you would not have succeeded. Suppose the day of Algiers had refused to agree to Lord Exmouth's terms the next day. What could he have done? Nothing. Depend upon it. He never would have gone in to attack them a second time with disabled ships and powder deficient. He would have been obliged to withdraw his fleet and it would have been a slap in the face for England. Moreover, you have taught those wretches what they wanted for the defense of the place. If you have struck terror to them, and that the terms you have made, continued he, be strictly adhered to for the future, you have done a great benefit to humanity, as well as having shown much maritime skill and bravery, but I do not believe that the Algerines will adhere to the stipulation that prisoners are not to be made slaves. I fear that they will be worse treated than they were before, in consequence of those barbarians not having any hope of ransom, which was the only reason they spared the lives of their captives. But now, having lost the hope of making money by them, they will massacre and throw them overboard or else mutilate them horribly. For you know that they conceive it to be a meritorious action to destroy heretics. He spoke in very high terms of Lord Nelson and indeed attempted to palliate that only stigma to his memory, the execution of Caraccioli, which he attributed entirely to his having been deceived by that wicked woman, Queen Caroline, through Lady Hamilton, and to the influence which the latter had over him while conversing with Napoleon, General Gorgo sent in his name and entered. He communicated some information rather in discordance with the message which the governor had directed me to deliver. It appeared that while taking a ride within the limits, he was stopped about 5 o'clock p.m. by the Sentinel at Hud's Gate and detained until released by the sergeant commanding the guard. He added, that almost every time he went out, the same thing occurred. The senators wishing to screen themselves from any responsibility. The sixth communicated this to Sir Hudson Lowe and brought him a letter from Captain Poppleton on the subject. His Excellency denied that the Sentinels had ever received any new orders and that it was the fault of the Sentinel. Cipriani informed me that Ponce de Borgo was the son of a shepherd in Corsica who used to bring eggs, milk, and butter to the Bonaparte family. Being a smart boy, he was noticed by Madame Mayer, who paid for his schooling afterwards. Through the interest of the family, he was chosen deputy to the legislative body as their sons were too young to be elected. He returned to Corsica as a Procuratore General, where he united himself with Peraldi, an implacable enemy of the Bonaparte, and consequently became one himself by the same authority. I was informed that Masseria, on his arrival at Paris, in order to obtain an interview with Napoleon, had applied to him, Cipriani for advice how to accomplish the subject, stating that he intended to apply to the Arch-Chancellor. Jeffrey I advised him by no means to do so, as possibly he might be arrested and tried being an emigrant, in which case he must be condemned to death, but to apply to Madame Mayer, to whom he was known. Masseria followed his advice and succeeded in obtaining an interview, although he failed in the attempt to open a negotiation in the subsequent endeavor to obtain an other. He received a hint to quit France. On making inquiry at Hutsgate, the sergeant commanding the guard showed a scrap of paper containing the orders to the sentinels, which were that none of the French, not even Bonaparte himself, were to be permitted to pass that post unless accompanied by a British officer. The sergeant also said, what indeed was notorious, that Sir Hudson Lowe frequently gave verbal orders himself, not only to the non-commissioned officers of the guard, but sometimes to the sentinels themselves, that those orders might be written down afterwards, or 
They might not. Dined with Sir Pulteney Malcolm in town, the seventh. Napoleon did not retire to rest until three in the morning. Having been employed dictating and writing until that hour, he got up again at five and went into a warm bath. Ate nothing until seven in the evening and went to bed before eight. The eighth had some more conversation concerning the Algerine business. Asked him if it were true that Desay had, a little before his death, sent a message of the following purport to him. Tell the first consul that I regret dying before I have done sufficient to make my name known to posterity. Napoleon replied, it was true. And accompanied it with some warm eulogiums on to say he breakfasted this morning in the English manner upon a little toast and tea. Weather so foggy the signals could not be passed. La Tamp, Sir Pulteney Malcolm, accompanied by Captains Maynell and Wochope. R.N. came to Longwood and had an interview with Napoleon. He recounted to the Admiral a sketch of his life, went to town, and applied to Sir Thomas Reed that permission might be granted to the French to purchase two cows, that a little good milk might be provided for the establishment. The fox so thick and the weather so bad that the signal of all's well could not be seen. Orderlies sent to acquaint the governor and Admiral the 11th. Weather is still very bad. The 12th saw Napoleon in his dressing room, gave him a newspaper of the 3rd of October, 1816, had some conversation with him relative to Chateaubriand, Sir Robert Wilson, ETC. I observed that some persons were surprised that he had never written or caused to be written in answer to Sir Thomas Wilson's work and others containing similar assertions. He replied that it was unnecessary that they would fall to the ground of themselves, that Sir Robert had already contradicted it by the answer which he had given in his interrogation when tried in Paris for having assisted Lavalette in his escape, and that he was convinced Wilson was now very sorry for having published what he then had been led to believe was true, that, moreover, the English who, returned from their travels in France, would return undeceived as to his character, and would undeceive their countrymen. I asked if he had not been very thin when he was in Egypt. He answered that he was at that time extremely thin, although possessed of a strong and robust constitution, that he had supported what would have killed most other men. After his 36th year, he began to grow fat. He told me that he had frequently labored in state affairs for 15 hours without a moment's cessation or even having taken any nourishment. On one occasion, he had continued at his labors for three days and nights without laying down to sleep. When Napoleon was rising up from table this day and in the act of taking his hat off of the sideboard, a large rat sprang out of it and ran between his legs to the surprise of those present. The 13th made inquiries from the purveyor if credit were given to the establishment on any articles allowed them by the government during the week which had not been consumed and whether they might be permitted to appropriate the value of such articles as had not been used to increase the allowance of others of which they had not a sufficient quantity or whether the savings so made were to be credited to the government. The reply was, any saving made by the establishment upon the English confectionery allowed them may be carried to increase the quantity of vegetables allowed, but all and every other saving is to be credited to the government, not to the French. About some weeks back, no saving of any description was permitted to be appropriated to increase the allowances in which there might be a deficiency. But after several representations have been made to me, during Napoleon's illness, of the deficiency of vegetables, Sir Hudson Lowe had directed that the value of the confectionery not used by them might be carried over to increase the allowance of provisions, that a very severe reprimand had been given to the purveyors in a letter from Major Goricker for having credited the value of the fruit allowed when none was to be procured on the island to increase the quantity of vegetables accompanied by a strict order never to repeat it.